Thank you, Paul. Boy, how do I follow that talk? Uh, I will give my, my best to it. So yes, I'm going to talk today about uh, place-based teaching, sort of a, a brief introduction general about the idea, but in particular I want to talk about two, uh, two specific projects that we've been involved in. Um, let's see, is this, oh, this is it, okay. The, the Trail of Time at Grand Canyon and a virtual field trip of Grand Canyon, both of which are actually related to each other. But uh, now, I know Carl yesterday, my, my colleague Carl Carlstrom wasn't able to stay. He could have been a co-author on this talk very easily. Um, asked how many geologists were in the audience. How many geographers are here? Okay, so we have a lot more geographers than we do geologists. And I'm a geologist by training and I'm an ethnogeologist by, by research, but uh, I, I claim very much that I have learned a great deal from geographers. And, and for the geographers in this room, some of this introductory stuff might be kind of routine for you, and I, I hope you'll bear with me. But um, the idea of place, okay? Place has come up over and over again in this conference. And um, many different definitions for place, but I, I prefer to use the one that geographers typically use, which is a locality that's been uh, given meaning through human experience. Um, uh, great geographers such as Yifu Tuan have written uh, extensively on this idea. And, and we just think about Grand Canyon, a, gra a landscape that is so meaningful, has been so meaningful to so many different cultures and people through millennia. And we can think about all the different kinds of meanings that have been affixed to Grand Canyon through human occupation of Grand Canyon through human history. Um, you know, beauty and allure, people come from all around the world to soak in the great beauty of Grand Canyon. Um, the fact that it's still a homeland to, to 12 different Native American nations, culturally important. Um, Carl talked yesterday about geologic mapping. I mean, Grand Canyon exposes about two billion years of the Earth's history, and there are few places on Earth that are so rich with, with significance, scientific significance. But as we've also talked about, this is a watershed year for Grand Canyon, being both the sesquicentennial of the Powell Expedition and the centennial of the National Park. And so there's, there's more recent historical significance, great educational value, recreational value, but also disputes, right? Disputes over issues such as uranium mining and water uh, quality and, and, and water resource use over the years. So all of these things make it a place. And the thing about place meaning is that, that each time somebody experiences a place. Each time somebody gives it a name or somebody does something in it, it adds to this, to this store of place meaning. Now, I really enjoyed that presentation on the cartoon maps today because, I, uh, again, I, I like to use them in my teaching too because uh, as a geologist, when I'm trying to express this idea of place to geology students, most of whom have been trained in a sort of a very physical science perspective, I like to, to turn to a geographer like Carl Sauer uh, you know, again, this is, this is kind of old school in, in the geographic realm, but to, to geologists, this stuff is still has a lot of uh, a great value in teaching that, that we have these interconnected, interwoven physical and cultural landscapes. And since really there's nowhere on earth that human beings have not either set foot or at least looked at or thought about, the cultural landscape is all pervasive. And the cartoon maps are a wonderful way of showing that, that uh, interweaving between the, the cultural and the, and the physical landscape or the natural landscape. And what I like to tell my students are if they want to think of places as the cultural equivalents of landforms in the physical landscape. Okay, that there, there's different kinds of processes that create places, but, but we can think of them in that way. And so place is a human construct, but we make places and places make us. Places influence the way that we think Places influence the way that we live. And since I'm interested in the teaching of geology, I'm very interested in the fact that, that our connection to place influences the way we understand the earth, how the earth works. You can't teach earth science, you can't teach any natural science really without engaging with places. We do it in and by means of places. So as Paul mentioned, I spent the first 15 years of my career teaching on the Navajo Nation at Dinah College the Tribal College of Navajo Nation. And I was a Western trained geologist. I came out there to teach earth science and I would go out into the field with my students. The, the school is 95% Native American. And I'd go out in the, the field with my students and I'd talk about the geology and we'd look at the rocks and we'd look at the landforms. We'd talk about the processes. And then when I was done, my students would tell me how they understood the land and how they saw the land. And I, I came to really appreciate how important the context of place is for teaching in the geosciences. And so my interaction with, with the native community on the Navajo Nation got me very interested in this idea of place-based education. Probably a lot of people have heard of that phrase, probably people in this room practice place-based education. Although interestingly enough, 
That term didn't actually show up in the literature until about 1978, even though it is ancestral because it is the uh, indigenous way of teaching and always has been. People who have strong connections to land, they teach in a place-based way. Uh, I like this quote by Greg Smith, who is one of the great scholars of place-based education, that place-based education is what happened before schools were created. Um, and here's an example of one that we were doing not at the Grand Canyon, but uh, above the canyon of the San Juan River. Uh, it was a, co a course that integrated both scientific and cultural knowledge. This is uh, Benny Begay, who was a Diné Hatafli, or medicine man, who was talking with us there. Now, when you get to national parks like Grand Canyon, we have this concept of interpretation. The, the teaching method that is indigenous to national parks is called interpretation. But it really is place-based education of another form because, it, again, what you're doing here is helping visitors make both intellectual and emotional connections to the landscape. That's, that's the definition of interpretation. And that is, that is fundamentally a very place-based way of teaching. So this idea of, of using place as context and relevance for teaching what in many cases is very concept-heavy science is, is something that I'm very interested in and I have been practicing and studying in the earth sciences for a number of years. And I, for the rest of the time here, I want to talk about two very specific examples of how we apply some of these methods uh, to place-based teaching at the Grand Canyon. One that is in person, the Trail of Time exhibition, and one that is virtual, the Grand Canyon immersive virtual field trip. So I'll start with the Trail of Time. So the Trail of Time is a exhibition that was funded by the National Science Foundation and I was part of, fortunate to be part of the team that designed and created it and it is very much at Grand Canyon today. How many people have been on the Trail of Time, by the way? Oh, I'm really glad to see that. Good. That's quite a few hands. Okay. So at Grand Canyon, we have a dynamic natural landscape that encodes almost 2 billion, 1.84 billion years of geologic history, maybe 1.9 if you count the age of some of the grains that are in some of the oldest rocks there but also a cultural landscape that encodes the, the names, experiences, and lives of, of people over m many millennia. And if you go to the South Rim, you go to the South Rim of the park, you can experience a great deal of this. You can go to the wonderful geologic museum at the Yav at Yavapai Point. You can go to the cultural museums. You can go to Verkamps. You can go to Mather Point. You can go to uh, uh, Desert View, where they're going to be establishing a, a new Native American cultural center in the next couple of years. But you know, if you really want to get the whole picture, you got to go down into the canyon. You got to get down there. You got to get down into the oldest rocks. You got to get down by the river. And here's a fundamental problem because somewhere between five and six million people visit Grand Canyon up on the south rim and to some extent the north rim, but a small fraction of that group actually gets down below the river and, or ever will be able to for either reasons of accessibility or socioeconomic reasons or just because they're never going to win the lottery, you know, and get a, get a boat trip. But um, how can we bring the experience that these lucky visitors, and I count myself fortunate having been able to take several river trips myself, um, up to the people who are coming up to the, to the South Rim. How can we bring that experience up to people in the South Rim? And, and hence the Trail of Time. The Trail of Time was conceived as an accessible timeline trail to introduce Grand Canyon geologic history to as many visitors as possible using place-based teaching elements. And we quite modestly refer to it as the world's largest geoscience exhibition at the world's grandest geological landscape. Okay, that's kind of a marketing speak there. But the, the whole point about the Trail of Time is that it is, a, it is an exhibition that allows visitors to experience the great panoramic vistas of Grand Canyon as well as the rocks that are found in Grand Canyon, all the rocks that occur in the canyon brought up to the, to the trail as well as carefully configured interpretive resources so that they can ponder not just the history of Grand Canyon itself, but the very idea of how big geologic time is in a very kinesthetic sense. So it's, a, it's an accessible trail. It's along the South Rim Trail, kinesthetic as well as visual. Um, it was funded by the National Science Foundation, all credit to them, with a great deal of, of logistical and in-kind support from the Park Service as well. Obviously, we could not have done this if not for the support of the Park Service. And I'm proud to say that the National Association for Interpretation uh, gave it a first place award for interpretive media in 2011, the year after it was first developed. So I want to I point out that the, it was a huge team that created the Trail of Time. And the Trail of Time was first conceived by Carl Karlstrom and, and his uh, wife and colleague, Lori Crossy. Of course, Carl spoke yesterday. Carl and Lori were here, but they were unable to stay because they had to move on to a, another geoscience conference. But 
They were the ones that first thought of the idea, and then they brought all the rest of us together with diverse disciplines, people in geoscience education, people in exhibit design, people in interpretation. Um, right here, like uh, Judy Helmick Bryan was the uh, chief of interpretation at the park at the time. Uh, Ellen Seeley was an interpretive ranger, is still an interpretive ranger. Uh, people who are expert in exhibit design and assessment as well. And with $2.3 $2 million from the NSF, we were off and running. So we conceived of the Trail of Time as a walking timeline that is scaled. So in other words, in the middle part of the trail, we had markers that were spaced about a meter apart, so it's kind of the equivalent of one long stride, and that represents one million years. And so 4.5 kilometers laid out along the south rim from Yavapai Point all the way out to uh, Maricopa Point here uh, encompassed uh, 4.5 billion years, or the history of the Earth. And then this first segment here, which we call the main trail of time, going out to 2,000 million years or 2 billion years, that encompasses the history of the rocks that actually occur in Grand Canyon. One of the things that we're really proud of, of, too, is we think that this is the probably the best evaluated geoscience exhibition in the entire national park system. And that's because when NSF funds money, they want a great deal of evaluation and, and research done with it. So even before we did anything at the park, we did mock-ups at ASU. We had uh, corridors of several of the buildings around here. We set up mock-up trail of time, and we had people come, and we basically wanted to know whether they could understand that they were walking on a timeline, and would they be able to navigate the scale changes? Would they be able to understand the spacing on the trail and how it related to geologic history? And then what we learned from there, we placed out to the park itself, and I'm very happy to say this was the most fun project I've ever been involved in. We had four years of basically playing at the South Rim with these, with these interpretive resources and then just asking people what they thought. So what we would do is we would put mock-ups of the interpretive signs and the markers on the trail and, and we would watch people. Okay, now we, we didn't want this to be creepy, so we put signs up here that said, you know, we are here observing and we all wore markers. So people knew why we were there to ask questions. But we asked visitors, well, what do you think of this? And we would actually make changes to the signs right there. Like we would ask them if they would understand a concept. And if it wasn't clear, we'd put masking tape over it and we'd rewrite it and say, does this make more sense now? And, and so this is what was called rapid, uh, rapid interpretation. And uh, uh, sorry, rapid uh, prototyping. And, and we did this and it worked pretty well to get, the, to get the design down. And so from 2007 to about 2010, we had the construction. We actually had to build much of it ourselves. We got some in-kind support from the park. And it was dedicated and turned over to the Park Service in 2010. So the components of the Trail of Time, the first part that's important is what we call the Million Year Trail or the on-ramp. And this is the idea that it basically takes you from a human perspective of time to a geologic perspective. At one end of the trail, the spacing is one meter per year. So you can actually walk on the trail. We love to do this with students when we take them up there. We say, go find the marker on the trail that corresponds to your age, right? So I'm like way out there somewhere. <laughs> okay, and these are my students. And there's, there's my dog. Uh, that's not dog years, that's, that's human years, but uh, it works well for dogs too. And the idea there is that, that as you walk the trail, you, you notice the, the scale is changing logarithmically. And by the time you get about 300 meters down the trail, you're now to a point where it's one meter per million years. And then you're ready to walk the main part of the trail. And the Trail of Time is introduced by these wonderful rock portals, which uh, recapitulate the geologic cross-section of Grand Canyon using the real rocks. Okay, these are the actual rock units from Grand Canyon, with the exception of the basement rock, which came from Colorado, actually, but it is essentially the same stuff that's down at the bottom of the Inner Gorge. That's one of the main components. Uh, the portals are located at all ends of the trail, and also there's a, there's a breakout point where the Shrine of Ages trail comes in, and we have the the portal there too in case people enter from that point. Sort of the heart of the exhibition are the trail markers. Okay, we have 2,500 markers that were deployed along the trail. Every one of them is, is one meter apart. Um, for the main part of the trail, we have these medallions which indicate the time and they're spaced 10 meters apart. And in between, we have these small individual meters of markers. So basically, you walk nine of these and then you get to the next one of these, which is 10, and you're walking out the history of the trail. We did not use billions. We decided to just stick with millions. So for example, instead of saying 1.68 billion, we said 1.1680 million, because testing indicated that was easier than, than shifting a lot of uh, time terms. It was easier for people to, to handle just millions the whole way. One of the interesting stories about this, when we designed these markers, is we had no idea that the inside diameter of one of these markers was exactly the same as the diameter of, of a penny. 
Okay, and not long after we established the trail, people started sticking pennies into those markers until every one of those 2,400 markers, the individual ones was filled with pennies. And we like that because that shows that people are interacting with the exhibition, and if anything, it's helping to preserve the, uh, preserve the resource, so we're fine with that. Another major component of the Trail of Time are the wayside panels, 17 panels designed to park service specifications. But what actually went into those panels? That was about three years worth of steady teleconferencing and debate and arguments, which, and, and the rapid prototyping on site, which led to designs with, with very conversational textile. The idea here is that we want to grab people's attention, but we don't want to be obtrusive. So we would have a phrase like, Vishnu rocks are near the canyon's bottom. And you could walk by and that's all you learn, that's fine. You've learned something about the Vishnu Schist. But if you want to stop, then you can read a little bit more and then you can look at the graphics. And so you can actually kind of draws you in to learn more about the, the history of the different rock units. And along the bottom of every one of these interpretive signs is a map showing where you are on the trail at that, at that point. So we had a number of these and, they, and they, the first one is right here. This sort of introduces the idea of what a timeline is. And then this one talks about the age of the canyon. It's exactly six meters from the start. And then at the far end, the oldest rock at Grand Canyon is the Elves Chasm Nice, which is 1.84 billion years old, and that's the sign that represents it. Beyond Grand Canyon Village, there are no markers in Grand Canyon Village because it's a historic site, but the trail picks up again at the right point outside Grand Canyon Village and goes on to four and a half billion years, 4.5 kilometers. Since there are no rocks at Grand Canyon that are that old, it basically the interpretive signs just talk about Earth history at that point. And yes, out at 13.7 kilometers away from the start of the trail, we do have a marker for the Big Bang. So there is, there is one out there. You can go find it. Um, view tubes, we had eight view tubes that point to certain outcrops. Very simple, they're just brass tubes that fit in the slot. One that's for kids or people in a wheelchair, that's one for taller people, and they point directly to features like the Bright Angel Shale with, with very simple text that goes along with it. Um, the rocks are probably the most fun part of the trail that people like the best. Um, there are about 45 different, depending on how you, whether you're a geologic lumper or a geologic splitter, there are about 45 different rock units that occur within the Grand Canyon system. Um, only a couple of them are actually encountered if you're on the rim. Pretty much if you walk on the rim, it's Kaibab limestone all the way. Okay, a few places you might see something else. So all of these rock samples were brought up from the park depths, from the depths of the canyon with the permission of the park. Most of them were brought out on boats, okay? If you're familiar with how a scientific river trip goes, particularly a geologic trip, the way it works is when you put in at least ferry, your, your boats are loaded down with um, beverages, okay? <laughs> And then all along the course of the river, you drink the beverages, you flatten the cans, and they go into a small space. And you have to have something to take up the volume where the beverages were before. So what's it going to be? Well, obviously rocks. So we collect the rock samples. So we come in with beverages. We come out with rock samples. And that's how a lot of these rocks were brought out. Some of the bigger ones, the Park Service actually allowed us uh, helicopter service. They actually lent us a helicopter to bring them out. So every single rock formation that is encountered in Grand Canyon is placed along the trail at the time marker corresponding to its age. Um, each rock was chosen for its durability and also chosen for its, its interpretive value. Um, each one has both polished and unpolished surfaces so you can see it. And as you can see, the plinths are designed to be, to be loved to death. Okay? We love to have people stand on the rocks, sit on the rocks, draw pencils, pencils uh, rubbings of the rocks and so on. And each one of them, it's kind of another interesting story. At the corner of each one of these plinths, we originally had a little wording that said, please touch. We want people to touch these rocks. We want people to interact with them. But when we did our prototyping and we showed please touch, people saw that and you know how they read it. They read it as please don't touch because that's what everybody's used to. Uh, uh, so, so instead, they say touch me. Okay, we had to, so that's another one of the things that we learned from the evaluation. So. Um, the Trail of Time has also facilitated some research on interpretation. Uh, this was my master's student, Becky Fruess. Once we put it in there, we were interested in how people interacted with the trail and how they learned. And one of the things we were very gratified, sort of after the fact, was that the visitors were getting the basic ideas of geologic time. The, the relative sequence in which superposition in which rocks are deposited, um, correlation of units across both sides of the canyon. The trail was able to teach that very effectively. And most of that work was published 
It's on there, so if anybody wants to build a trail of time in another place, that material is there for, for people to, uh, to read and, and redesign. And I, if people will be happy, I'll have my uh, website up at the end there. I'd be happy to share that information with anyone who's interested. But for the last couple of minutes of my talk, I think I've got about five more minutes, something like that, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the other side of, of place-based teaching, the virtual side, okay? Um, we at ASU are also very interested in immersive virtual field trips, okay? Because we recognize that, that even though I'm a dyed-in-the-wool field geologist, I realize that there are many places in this world that are geologically, they're places that are pedagogically powerful. They're geologically rich, but they're accessible only to a relative few. And if we're going to share the pedagogical value, the, the instructional value relating to geology or geography or ecology or anything, we're going to have to find a different way to bring it to students. And the way we do that is through technology. And so we have been pioneers in the idea of immersive virtual field trips, web-hosted, 360-degree immersive environments set all around the world, including Grand Canyon. And this is the website. You can go to this website right now, and you can, or later on, and you can encounter any one of these field trips, and you can take it right there on, on any device. It's a, a phone or a tablet or a computer. So with another grant from the National Science Foundation, uh, my colleague Jeffrey Bruce, who's here, who's a, a videographer, and Professor Ariel Anbar, uh, a colleague of mine at ASU, we went on a Carl Karlstrom river trip in 2013, and we collected an enormous amount of video footage, and we uh, came up with this virtual field trip. Now, I'm going to, hopefully this is going to work. You know, it's one thing, it's one thing I can um, talk about this, but the best way to show it is, um, is this going to work? Let's see. Maybe I have to get out of this presentation. I know I'm running out of time here, so let me, let me see if it should be. Okay, here we go. Everybody see that? So if you go to VFT and you go to the Grand Canyon, you click on the, van, the Grand Canyon, it'll take you to a splash page like that. And there are two options. We have what we call a free inquiry virtual field trip and a guided inquiry field trip, which takes you up Black Canyon, which gives you a good in expo exposure to the great unconformity. So I'm going to just very briefly show you what, you what you get when you jump into one of these trips. Is it plops you down in, uh, right at the Nankoweep granaries in the canyon. Okay, and you have a 360 degree panorama. You can look up, you can look down, you can navigate around, and embedded in the screen are all kinds of video and audio uh, aids. Like for example, this is Gigapan. So if you're familiar with Gigapan, Gigapan is a wonderful technology that, that stitches hundreds of high resolution photographs together. So there you have the wall of the Paleozoic rocks looking across from the Yankoweep granaries, and it's a pretty big image, but what you can do is you can zoom in, and what you find when you zoom in is the resolution is just as high no matter how close you get. That's the wonderful thing about Gigapan. So it actually allows you to go places in the canyon that you could not go to without, you know, without being a mountain climber, that sort of thing. So we have that, and we have a number of, let's see if I can close that up, we have a number of instructional videos that talk about uh, Grand Canyon geology. So, for example, um, here we have yours truly. We also have videos by Carl Karlstrom and Lori Crossy talking about the geology of Grand Canyon at all of these different locations. So we have these videos that kind of moderate what's going on as well to talk about the rock layers. Um, and then we have a, a few minutes, thanks. We have a Google map uh, page here. We have about uh, 30 some odd stops along the river that you can travel to. Um, you can travel to uh, them either by jumping on the map or you can just click to the next thing. I, I also want to show you we have one kind of cool set of videos here. Let's see if I can show this one in the last couple of minutes. This is called 360 degree video. Okay, so here we are, we're, dry, we're, we're floating down the canyon and look what you can do. You can look in, in all directions at all times. So here we are, floating down through the basement rocks. Look at that, I mean, look at that beautiful basement. You can see the Vishnu schist and you can see the, the, uh, the very furry Jeffrey Bruce down there, and, and, uh, but you can see the, you know, the, the rocks are spectacular. So we have all of these different videos and uh, you can navigate up and down the canyon. Okay, so you can go and you click on these little green dogs here and they can take you up. For example, this is hiking up Nankoweep Canyon. 
You can go all the way up through the Butte Fault up into the Chuar Valley. And every one of these locations has all these tremendous uh, resources, as well as these wonderful 360 degree panoramas. So running out of time, I'd love to just like take you on this trip for the next hour or so, but I would encourage you to have a look at that at your leisure. And I'll just sort of finish up. Oh, there I go. So IVFT technology offers access and perspective, as I've shown, that are not always readily accessible in situ, um, as well as all of these other interpretive resources that we put in there. Um, we have done some research on pairing both the in-person trip, the trail of time, with the IVFT. And I have a student here who recently completed his master's and is now finishing his PhD. And, and the bottom line is that the virtual field trip is not really com competition for the in-person field trip. If anything, it complements it because most students, the first time they have a field experience, they tend to be very preoccupied by things other than learning. They worry about what they're going to wear, where they have to go to the bathroom, where they're going to eat, that sort of thing. The nice thing about a virtual field trip is it can help them get over those preoccupations before they actually go out into the field. So this is the research that's underway. We're still in the process of, of integrating the IVFT technology and the, uh, the field-based technology through the uh, Trail of Time in, in a more effective way. And so I think I will end here. Um, if you're interested in checking out the Grand Canyon VFT, there's the website. If you're interested in the Trail of Time, there's the website. And if I can answer any further questions for you, there's my website. Uh, one thing I want to draw attention to is that in September, September 22nd, the Geological Society of America is going to hold this annual meeting right here in Phoenix. And so uh, it's a great opportunity for those of you who are interested in, in uh, Grand Canyon. There are going to be a number of sessions related to Grand Canyon happening at this conference. And so um, if you've never been to a GSA meeting before, it's going to be right here in town. So I would certainly encourage you to look into it. And I'd be happy to answer questions about that too because I'm also working on that meeting. So thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Dr. Semkin? Steve. Questions for Steve. Okay. Um, I, it was a great presentation. Thank and uh, I'm, I'm looking at all the, this talk as well as other talks through the lens of perspective of a botanist. And I want to say that all these talks, and, and yours included, uh, really helps our work in studying plants uh, within Grand Canyon. One of the, one of my, uh, it's actually a comment is, and I'm so glad that you brought out that uh, with the cultural as well as natural landscape and as a, a botanist and ethnobotanist, we tend to even take it a little bit further because we have so much evidence where we look at plants plant species and plant communities as having been influenced, that's a, like a legacy effect, from uh, what people did centuries ago and what we see in the landscape today reflects that. And so we take, we, we rarely in many areas in the southwest Arizona, including Grand Canyon, even bring up the word natural landscape. We call it a, a biocultural landscape. So, so it takes care, takes care of that, you know, that very, very tight uh, interconnection with with uh, the people and the, and the activities of so long ago up to the present and and the landscape that we see. But thank you very much. Thank you. And then I would have to say that we ethnogeologists we hold ethnobotany as sort of like the bar that we'd like to aspire to someday, as far as how much you've been able to accomplish. And I didn't really have a chance to talk too much about the specific ethnogeological cultural elements that, that go into some of this teaching. If I had another hour, I could do that as well. But, but that is part of it. We are very interested. We do work with, with traditional knowledge keepers in appropriate, culturally appropriate ways to integrate that, those sorts of knowledge, starting with things as simple as place names. Okay, what are the original place names? Not the ones that have been imposed later by people who came later, but what are the, what are the you know, original place names? We use those. One of the, oh, oh. I wanted to ask if your team is um, considering uh, augmented reality. So at the risk of having people walk around the canyon rim looking at their phones and falling off, um, you know, and, and also the risk of just looking at their phones, which I right. think they're already doing. But the opportunity for learning, for staying longer, for possibly uh, getting some amount of enrichment or education that surpasses the experience of 15 minutes at the end, uh, I take a selfie and I'm back in my car. 
The short answer for that is we are not. However, uh, there is a woman by the name of Natalie Burston, who used to be at the uh, Cal State Fullerton. Uh, she's now teaching at a university in British Columbia. She created an augmented reality field trip to Grand Canyon, okay, which is, which basically, they, she was at Utah State University, and they did the trip like out on the football field. And so they would have their phones, and they were essentially hiking through Grand Canyon on the football field. So yes, I mean like the, the Pokemon Go kind of model for, for instruction. We definitely think that's a great idea. We're not doing it, but, but uh, I would look up uh, Natalie Burston, and her name is really difficult to spell, but, but uh, the uh, GSA, the Geological Society of America uh, monthly journal, GSA Today, about a, about a year and a half ago, had a cover story about her AR field trip. So yes, I, I fully agree that that's, that's very useful. Is there an existence, or do you have plans to develop curricula uh, targeted to different grade groups, um, you know, crosswalked with um, curriculum objectives and things like that that would be applied in the classroom? We are starting to work on that for Grand Canyon. We actually have for other resources. Okay, if you go to that VFT site, there are about 25 different virtual field trips, and one of them is called Red Rocks. It actually starts at Sedona and ends up in Mars and talks about what makes rocks red, right? Talks about how the red planet got red, but it starts in Sedona with, you know, with the red rocks there. So, and that one is actually oriented toward high school and middle school, uh, but also has undergraduates. So the answer is yes, we're working on that. We have a program at ASU called the, the Center for uh, Exploration, Education Through Exploration, or ETX, which is working on that. I had the website earlier, it's just etx.asu.edu. But if you go to the VFT site, it's there. The Red Rocks is there. I know I'm keeping you away from your coffee. I have one. Yes, sir. Please stand. Please stand. Uh, unusual comment. Have you created any uh, virtual trips going through the rapids? Yeah, I w actually, if I had a little more time, I was going to show. We did have one video of, of going through. Uh, I, I think we have one through Hans, and uh, we have one through um, farther up in the river, like Soap Creek or something like that. Um, but Hans is kind of fun. Yeah, they're, they're in there. There are, there are Rapids videos embedded in there. Um, we tried to do one through lava, but it got like totally soaked. <laughs> so I don't, think the, I don't think it worked. But, uh, but Hans, I think Hans turned out really well, which is, you know, Steph, Hans is a fun rapid. My favorite is, is Hermit. We didn't do one in Hermit. We should have done Hermit. Of course. Close your eyes if you don't want to see it. <laughs> All right. Let me, um, yeah, I mean, if you want to, do we, maybe we should do, I mean, you want me to do it now or do you want to do it during the break or? Let's just do it now. Let's do it now. Okay, let's do it now. Right, knock it out. I was just going to ask, is the rapids more fun at the beginning of your trips or the end of the trips? <laughs> let's see. Where's your, um, I had the, uh, the link here. Is there a? So here's the, here's the actual VFT page, okay? And you can see all the different trips that are available, right? So Dinosaur Doom is kind of fun, Red Rocks, um, early civilizations, but then you go to Grand Canyon, and here's Grand Canyon. And then you click on that, and you want to open up the page. Do we have sound on here? Because the one of them does have sound. No, we don't have sound. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, there's, there's actually a soundtrack for it. Oh, no, come on. What the heck? <coughs> Wait a minute. Let me try that again. That, that can't be. <coughs> yeah. Close that window. Okay, let's try it again. I had it a moment ago. Huh. All right, I have no idea why this is happening. Chrome. Okay, it's, I don't see Chrome on here. It's Chrome must be somewhere. Oh, there it is. Okay, let's try Chrome. It should work with all browsers, all tools. And if this works, Google, we hope you're watching, and you should have sponsored this event. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's try again. There we go. I'll 
hopefully. Yay, there we go. Okay, let's see. Here's one of them. It's got great sound. I just don't have the, I don't think we have the. No, 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 no. There's yours truly there. Scratching his nose. <laughs> Here we go. So this is down near the Uncar Delta. No, it's not. A th we didn't do 360 through the rapids because the instrument was too, too sensitive. So we just did regular uh, GoPro for this. So here we go. This is OK. It's not a huge rapid. I, I'll look for Hans next. Hans was better. <laughs> oh, here's Hans. Here's Hans. There's the, there's the dike. That's the, that's the famous igneous dike at Hans there that's graced the pages of a million textbooks that we're passing. The one on the right there, this thing. It's in every geology textbook. So this is one of the bigger rapids on the river. This is Hans Rapid. No, this isn't. Wait a minute. This is in the basement, so this is a different one. Sorry. But it's a, this is a bigger This might be crystal. Anybody know? Which one is it? Is it, is it, is it Sock Dolliger. Okay, Sock Dolliger. That wasn't Hans. Hans was on there somewhere. Buddy getting dizzy? We had a good boatman. There's Hans. There's Hans. Not really in order here, but here we go. Whoa! Yeah, that was that was fun. Twenty thirteen. So we had the GoPro tied to one of the water containers. I think how we did it. So, so you can see the screw. The uh, lens is getting wet. I think part of what happens is as you go down the river, you start moving farther forward in the boat. You get a little bit more, more courageous as the time goes on. So anyway, there you have it. So thanks. <clears throat>